Cosford UFO Incident and Mike DeBartleben. Tales of hauntings, murder, and scary mysteries. Every week, Twisted Twos dives into a pair of uniquely terrifying true stories that are worthy of a more in-depth look. For this week, we focus on the mysterious Cosford UFO Incident and the notorious yet relatively unknown man named Mike DeBartleben. Get ready for Scary Mysteries, Twisted Twos. Number 1. Cosford UFO Incident In March of 1993, the people in the town of Cosford, England were in for a surprise. Around 8.30 p.m. on March 30, 1993, the Somerset police began receiving reports of a large unknown object flying overhead. The first detailed report came from an off-duty police officer. He was at Quintock Hills heading a group of local scouts when they all noticed a large object flying above them. The officer described it as two Concords flying side by side and joined together. As the night wore on, people from different walks of life reported seeing the UFO, many describing it as triangular. Others confirmed they saw it but didn't attempt to report it to authorities. Some reports from witnesses said it was hovering around 200 to 400 feet above the ground. One family from Staffordshire said they saw the object land on a nearby field while in their car. Like other reports, they described it as triangular or diamond-shaped. They raced to the landing area where they thought the craft landed but were unsuccessful in locating it. They described the object as emanating a humming sound, a very low frequency sound. They added, you didn't just hear the sound, but you actually felt it as well. In the early morning of March 31st, the same UFO was spotted flying over the Royal Air Force Base, RAF Cosford. According to RAF police officers, the craft was flying overhead at great speed. They approximated it was about 1,000 feet from the ground. Curiously, when they checked radar signals, it didn't pick up the UFO at all. They later found out one of the prime radar heads was somehow disabled also. RAF Cosford then phoned RAF Shawbury, 12 miles away, thinking they might be able to see what the UFO actually was. The base meteorologist took the call and when he looked into it, he was surprised to see a solid object. He described it as about 200 feet long, and it was emanating a low hum. According to the meteorologist, Wayne Elliott, while he was looking at the craft, he saw it was putting out a beam of light directed towards a field beyond the perimeter base. It was tracking in a sweeping motion as if it was looking for something on the ground. Afterward, the beam of light retracted and then the craft slowly moved off, flying somewhere between 20 to 40 miles per hour initially, before shooting off in mock acceleration in a matter of seconds. Aside from the meteorologist, several civilian witnesses also corroborated this scene. The next few days and months are a flurry of reports about the UFO sighting. There was also a Ministry of Defense also known as MOD, investigation because of the amount of sightings generated by witnesses. According to MOD, they identified all the aircrafts and helicopters flying that night and managed to eliminate them as possible culprits. They also ruled out astronomical phenomena to be a possible cause. However, it was revealed a Russian rocket that was carrying a communication satellite, Cosmos 2238, was re-entering the atmosphere that night. It's believed as it re-entered, it broke off into pieces which explained the high altitude lights and accounted for the number of sightings around 1.10 a.m. The Russian satellite debris is still promoted by skeptics to be the reason for the UFO sightings that night. However, Wayne Elliott, the meteorologist, spotted the UFO an hour after that time frame making it impossible to be the cause of the UFO that he saw. Other possible explanations skeptics have proposed is that it was a black project, maybe a prototype aircraft or drone. The MOD even asked the U.S. government about Aurora, which was said to be a hypersonic replacement for the SR-71 Blackbird. 
They wondered if something had gone wrong from the normal procedure causing the craft to fly overhead another country. However, the response, according to MOD investigator and later ufologist Nick Pope, was that they had no idea what it was. The Americans instead said they had seen similar triangular-shaped UFOs over their airspace and wondered if the RAF had a similar craft that could move at such great speeds. What fascinated Nick Pope at the time was it revealed that despite the closure of Project Blue Book in 1969, there were still people interested in the subject of UFOs in the United States. Later on, it was revealed the U.S. did have secret projects and organizations designed to study UFO phenomenon, but in secret. In the end, the MOD's investigations could not determine the source of the sightings. But the final report included the line that the object would appear to be of considerable defense significance, a far cry from the usual no defense significance line used by MOD and other sightings. Even more curious with the Cosford incident is it happened exactly three years from what is considered the most remarkable UFO sighting in Europe, the Belgium Wave. This Belgium Wave was a set of UFO sightings witnessed by more than 1,000 people all across Belgium. It caused the scrambling of two fighter jets as the objects were captured on radar. Although it spanned several months, the peak of the sightings occurred between March 30th to March 31st in 1990. Number 2. Mike DeBartleben Even if he's not a household name, Mike DeBartleben could be one of the most notorious and dangerous serial criminals that has ever lived. Coming from Little Rock, Arkansas, DeBartleben moved around a lot during his childhood because his dad was in the U.S. Navy. He lived in Kentucky, Texas, and in Germany with his family, including a brother named Ralph and a younger sister whose name isn't known. By 16, he was arrested for assaulting his mother. It's unknown what caused the incident, but after this, he bought handguns and ammunition with a friend. He was later arrested and convicted for possessing a concealed weapon. This was one of the first of the many arrests he would experience. Soon after, he got expelled from high school and he joined the Air Force. A year in, he was court-martialed for bad behavior. He was eventually discharged at 18. He tried high school again in Texas, but was expelled. In August of 1959, he married his first wife, but they separated just three weeks later. This was followed by a string of arrests for DeBartleben. He was involved in attempted robberies and auto theft and was placed on probation for five years. In June of 1960, he impregnated and married his second wife, Charlotte. They had two children, but the second one was given up for adoption. The following year, DeBartleben's brother Ralph committed suicide. It wasn't until the 80s when DeBartleben would become notorious for counterfeiting. By this time, Secret Service agents were investigating cases where a man would walk into a store holding a fake $20 bill. He would proceed to buy small items from a variety of stores, receiving real cash as change. The fake bills were found used in different states including New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky. Multiple reports of the counterfeit were filed, and at least one sample was sent to the Secret Service's Forensic Services Lab. They identified several small defects in the bills. The first specimen was identified as circular number 7215, he also had two other batches made, which became known as specimens 7373 and 7404. To create his counterfeits, DeBartleben used a 10-step technique from choosing the right paper, printing, tea dipping, and hand crumbling the bills to make them seem more authentic. Eventually, he grew more proficient at his counterfeiting, and by 1982, he had passed around over $130,000 worth of counterfeits in over 44 different states. He became a priority for the Secret Service and was dubbed as the Mall Passer. On May 25, 1983, DeBartleben went inside a mall in Knoxville, Tennessee and went around the stores purchasing small items using his counterfeit bills. The clerks managed to identify him 
and alerted the Secret Service and mall security. Before he realized what was happening, he was arrested. DeBartleben remained quiet and refused to answer any questions during his arrest. Hoping to find his counterfeiting plant, the Secret Service agent searched his vehicle only to find various items indicating that aside from counterfeiting, he may have committed more atrocious crimes. An agent in Washington, D.C. found his storage unit, and when they searched it, they found crucial evidence of his heinous crimes. He had homemade torture audio tapes, photographs of sex slangs, and a death kit containing handcuffs, chains, shoelaces, KY jelly, and even a woman's bloody underwear. After this discovery, the FBI was contacted, but they were reluctant to help because at this point, Despite the indications and evidence of a crime, there were no known victims yet. An audio tape found in the locker was of a woman being tortured and was begging to die. This woman on the tape was later discovered to be his fourth wife, whom he had forced to act out a torture scene he had written. But this didn't mean there were no genuine victims. In fact, it's unclear how many victims he actually had. Further locker searches led officers to uncover more pornography, more counterfeit money, and a printing press to print money. After the FBI showed reluctance in helping, the Secret Service agents tracked violent crimes within the time frame of DeBartleben's counterfeit activity and finally uncovered his true identity. Up until that time and during his arrest, he had been using various aliases and fake identification cards. Once his real identity was known, however, his previous crimes also came to light. After further investigation, authorities finally managed to uncover some of his victims. One of the first was picked up in 1978 in Delaware. Lucy Alexander had just had a fight with her boyfriend and was walking on a deserted road. DeBartleben posed as a police officer, handcuffed her, and took her to his house. There, he repeatedly raped and sodomized her before releasing her in an isolated area. On February 4th of 1979, he kidnapped a North Carolina real estate agent named Elizabeth Mason. He pointed a gun at her. When she realized she was going to be raped, she fought back, hitting and screaming. DeBartleben choked and banged her head on the wall, then left her for dead after taking her purse. Another victim, Lori Jensen was kidnapped in June of 1979. DeBartleben again impersonated an officer and then took Jensen to his home where he raped and sodomized her for 24 hours. He took pictures of her and forced her to call him daddy. She was later released blocks away from her home. His next known victim was in November of 1980 when he pulled over Diane Overton. While DeBartleben managed to handcuff her in his vehicle, she fought back, kicking him before managing to find the door handle and escape to safety. Two weeks later, he kidnapped Maria Santini at gunpoint. He took her home, stripped her, and posed her suggestively. This time, he didn't rape the victim, but groped her instead. She was later released. Two years later, in April of 82, he kidnapped a real estate agent in Bossier City, Louisiana after posing as a client. The victim's body, Jean McFall, was later found in the rafters of a new home with two stab wounds to the chest. She was clothed and her purse was gone. DeBartleben's wives later came forward saying they were subjected to the same humiliating sexual and sadistic fantasies as victims had likely gone through. By the time the FBI managed to piece together evidence against them, DeBartleben faced 11 indictments with two for murder in nine different states. There were six charges for counterfeiting in different states, robbery, sodomy, and armed criminal action in Missouri. He was also charged with kidnapping in Connecticut and Baltimore. Eventually, he was tried and convicted based on forensic evidence, witnesses, and victim testimony. He would go on to receive 375 years in prison. While in prison and throughout his life, DeBartleben refused to say anything or even acknowledge his crimes. It's believed that he had been committing these heinous crimes for 18 years. Compared to Ted Bundy, who was active for about five years and yet killed between 30 to 100 women, 
De Bartleben was largely operating for much longer, unknown, despite several arrest warrants in nine states. Many officers believe he may have committed more murders and rapes than what is recorded, but those will most likely never be heard about. Mike de Bartleben Jr. died in 2011 while in prison from a bout of pneumonia when he was in his 70s. So there were two of the most out of this world and vicious stories around. The world can be a crazy place and Twisted Twos is always sure to show you why. If you like this video, then please remember to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday for you to check out. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.